Well, hey there, fellow sojourners, and welcome back to another edition of Appropriate in the Culture. We're in the full holiday season, lights, trees, mistletoe, eggnog, holiday music, and of course, insidious authoritarian fascist propaganda. Wait, what? Or at least that's the claim of Salon with their article on how Hallmark movies are fascist propaganda. I'm Pastor Shane, and I'll try to keep a straight face as we appropriate some culture. Now this is actually a Salon article from 2019 when fascism was all the rage, you couldn't swing a dead cat without hitting a fascist, and dead cats were plenty because of fascism, presumably. And this was mostly due to Donald Trump, quote, Hallmark movies with their emphasis on returning home and the pleasures of the small domestic life also send a not at all subtle signal of disdain for cosmopolitanism and curiosity about the larger world which is exactly the sort of attitude that helps breed the kind of defensive white nationalism that we see growing in strength in the Donald Trump era. But while notorious authoritarian fascist Donald Trump was toppled by an election, as most authoritarians are, Hallmark's reign is not so easily undone. But what exactly makes it so authoritarian? The emphasis on returning home, the pleasures of small domestic life has probably less to do with goose-stepping Nazis and more to do with the fact that the general audience of Hallmark viewers are domestic women. There's a bit of a selection bias there, and all networks curate to their audience. That's like being upset that ESPN has sports or that Comedy Central eschews drama. But what else makes it fascisty? Running down this year's schedule of Christmas movie offerings is like a trip into an uncanny valley of shiny teeth, blow-dried, heteronormative whites with only a few token movies with characters of color. It's like watching the Stepford Wise, but scarier since the evil plot to replace normal people with robots is never actually revealed. None of this should be a surprise because Hallmark movies, as cloying and saccharine as they are, constitute the platonic ideal of fascist propaganda. That is probably a startling statement to some. And by some, she means people with a functional prefrontal cortex. So the problem is not that minorities aren't featured, they are. It's just that the minorities are in the minority when it comes to the majority of Hallmark movies. And any time a minority is not the majority, that's because of fascism. A lack of diversity is the clearest sign of fascism, like the authoritarian states of Finland and Iceland, whose populations are like 95% Caucasian. Those countries are always dreaming of white Christmases. Now all of this is clearly dumb, but what really started this think piece was, as usual, the LGBTQ movement, as Salon explains. The cable TV behemoth, which has been minting money with its patented holiday season schmaltz, drew widespread criticism earlier this month when it pulled ads for the wedding company Zola that featured a lesbian couple kissing at their wedding. One million moms and the American Family Association complained, Hallmark dropped the sponsorship, but then the alphabet crowd came after Hallmark, and so of course Hallmark flip-flopped. Hallmark CEO said, Hallmark will be working with GLAAD to better represent the LGBT community across our portfolio of brands. Which is unfortunate because as the Salon article indicates, conformity is a sign of authoritarianism. The qualities that people cite when they defend Hallmark movies, comforting, formulaic, soothing, are all a result of the aggressively conformist impulse that drives them, and that impulse and fealty to the dominant culture stands in direct contrast to the values of diversity. As we clearly laid out on previous episodes, the LGBTQ culture is the dominant culture. That Hallmark didn't conform to it made it an outlier, which is why people reacted so strongly to a lesbian ad. As Hans Fein, a notorious fascist, makes the point in The Federalist, in a theological sense, the Hallmark Channel is not a Christian broadcasting network. More to the point, the 6,000 original Christmas movies the network airs every December are not genuinely Christian films and content. But, culturally speaking, Hallmark Christian movies are noticeably Christian. The characters don't take off their clothes, murder anyone, or use profanity. The hero loves children and defends the poor. The heroine, who begins the story loving her self-involved life in the city, chooses family and a life of self-sacrifice in her hometown by the end of the tale. 
So, if you're a pious Christian mom who wants to escape into a universe where all the cynicism and immorality of modern life aren't allowed, or if you want to snuggle up with your eight-year-old daughter and watch a silly movie without having to explain inappropriate content you weren't expecting, the Hallmark Channel is about the only place left that will let you do it. And yeah, the true problem for Salon is that Hallmark offers content that doesn't conform with the dominant culture. And diversity of thought and perspective cannot be tolerated at Salon because the true authoritarian was here all along. Now, this is all quite silly in most respects, but I think it's actually instructive in a couple of ways. Number one, Hallmark movies and the like are not Christian. They're family-friendly and they're clean in the sense that they're devoid of profanity, nudity, drugs, violence, or sex. But clean doesn't equal Christian, as Hans correctly points out. They're not Christian films in content. And in some ways, are just as much an indication of cultural decay in our society as other movies. If you were just looking at the culture and you didn't know what Christmas was really about, you would probably conclude that Christmas is about romance. It's got to be a romantic holiday akin to Valentine's Day because so much of the movies and content, like the Hallmark movies, are centered on romance. You see it everywhere. Our culture is very confused about Christmas. We love it, but since we desperately seek to avoid Christ and Mass, we're left flailing for some sort of meaning. You can feel the strain in our culture of not wanting Christ, but desperately wanting meaning in the season. And the most meaningful thing we can conjure in our secular society is romantic love. And so we're left with a slew of saccharine movies with a veneer of Christmas and a soft focus lens. That's a little sad, but it doesn't make it fascist propaganda. Which is the second thing that is instructive here. What is propaganda? A dictionary definition might say something like, information, especially of a bias or misleading nature, used to promote or publicize a particular political cause or point of view. That's a pretty elastic word that could encompass quite a bit. Most everything has a bias, and pretty much all films have a point of view. Does that make all films propaganda? Or let's be more specific here. In the Valley of Elah, Lions for Lambs, The Deer Hunter, these are anti-war films. They have a bias. They have a point of view. Is that propaganda? Or what about uh, political movies? Frost Nixon, W, Vice, right? Those have a bias. They have a perspective articulated in their narratives. Is that propaganda? Yeah. Sure, most works of art can conceivably fit within the definition of propaganda because most storytellers and artists have a point of view that they communicate in their work. But as we've been talking about in the last few weeks, word choices can shape our thinking. Propaganda is a dirty word with a negative connotation. So were any of those films I listed called propaganda? Nope. Several were considered high art and nominated for awards. You'll notice that what makes something propaganda or not is whether or not you agree with the point of view. That's the dirty trick critics use. So Dinesh D'Souza's documentaries are propaganda, but Michael Moore's documentaries aren't. When reality is, they're all propaganda. But that also applies to fiction. A film with a Christian bias putting forth a Christian worldview will be labeled as propaganda, but any sort of secular bias putting forth a secular worldview is just art. Case in point, Hallmark is propaganda because it has a bias toward domesticity, but the Zolo ad with lesbians getting married isn't propaganda because I, at Salon, agree with the message. See how that works? Convenient, isn't it? As people who want to appropriate the culture, we're going to have to be aware that messages and themes that contradict the values and perspectives of the critics are going to be labeled as propaganda. That's just reality, and we should go into this with eyes wide open. But more to the point, there is a reason why propaganda is a vilified term. Storytellers and artists have biases, and they have perspectives. And seeing that come out of their work is partially what makes the art interesting. The Hallmark Fair is low art precisely because it has nothing to say. It's vapid, it's empty, it has no true perspective, and it's not trying to. In that sense, it's one of the least propagandistic products. But when the artist's perspective becomes the central issue, when the story becomes just a means to cram in their bias, uh, that's when it slips into propaganda. And you know those films, I probably mentioned some of them already, and you probably loathe them, as you should. But the same is true for Christian content as well absolutely have a bias, absolutely have a perspective and convey it, but it can't overtake the narrative and it shouldn't overtake the art itself. 
Because if you're not trying to do something more than simply communicate your views, then just write an essay. Now, hopefully a better essay than calling Hallmark movies fascist propaganda. Well, that's it for today. Uh, you know the drill. Like, subscribe, rate, review. Enjoy the Hallmark movies, you fascists. And I'll see you next week for more Appropriate in the Culture. Music